I'm in the same patch as you, um, and uh, Aotea Te Waka. Um, and uh, for the nunas and the koraua in the room, uh, my grandfather was in Ashford, so I'm from Ōtoko and Parikino. Kia ora. Um, so anyway, I oh, put that up here, not just because it's debuting again today on TV, and spoiler alert, John Snow still knows nothing, but... Um, <laughs> I, I put that up there because um, I don't have a background in tuna, apart from knowing how to eat it. So I just wanted to highlight that Sheree plus tuna equals Jon Snow, as in Sheree knows nothing about tuna. <laughs> but I do kind of apparently know a little bit about wetlands, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, and a lot of people t <laughs> come up to me and say, hey, Cherie, what's a wetland? And I go, well, it's land, which is wet. Um, it's basically, in technological terms, poor drainage or accumulation of water. Um, and some of our people knew them as repo, repo raupo, repo repo, mania. Um, scientists know them as swamps, estuaries, fens, seepages, flushes, marshes, Ephemeral dips, hollows, tarns, kettle holes, bogs, pahikihi, blankets, string mires, la 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 la. Um, so wetlands are about connections and connectivity, and I thought it was kind of relevant to talk about them today because they're one of the most important, well, not most important, but they're a very important habitat for our tuna when they come home from um, across the oceans. And um, they're actually, our people probably would have seen them as part of a bigger whole rather than seeing them as these separate things. And often when you see wetlands, they're the bits of land that are wet that sit between the really, really dry lands and then you might see a lake or a river. But um, to our ancestors, they're probably just seen as one big system. Um, they are incredibly important though because they have this funny kind of being a bit wet and a little bit dry. Some very, very unique uh, birds, plants and insects live in there. So we have this thing on the bottom there that's called Fred the Thread. And he was found in this special plant here called Sporodanthus in the Waikato. And um, they didn't even know he really existed until they found him. Um, but there's all these other beautiful birds over here that we know as well. And I wanted to highlight the kawo down here, or the shag. Um, the reason I wanted to highlight that, it was really interesting listening to the corridor around the extermination groups or something that used to go out and hunt the tuna. Um, Kawo were actually allowed to be shot right up until the 1940s if they were taking fish out of a net. Um, they're still only partially protected, even though they're a native bird, and even though they're actually at risk and declining now. So it's interesting that we have these amazing birds and plants and animals, like a tuna as well, that are given less protection than something that's come from England. Just wanted to highlight it. Um, and then, of course, we have, uh, they were important for our mahinga kai, for our recreation, hiding and storage, and of course, that's where a lot of our tuna go when they come back to the freshwater systems. So we have all this amazing history between our people and these spaces and all the taonga that live with them, but where are the stories that we have about these spaces? So, um, first of all, uh, land care research, Manaki Whenua, as a lot of you would know them as, created 10 years ago, 10 or 11 years ago, uh, this book called The Wetland Restoration Handbook, and it was designed to try and give a bit of advice to people on the ground, like communities in Marae, on how you could do some wetland restoration. But it was missing some corridor that had come from us. So to try and fill that gap, when I was working for Waikato Tainui, which you can invoice them for later, um, oops, we decided that we needed to find a way of getting our voices and our stories out there about wetlands. So we came up with this book called Te Reo Te Repo, which was just published uh, late last year, I think, or early this year, everyone, is that right? Early this year. Um, and it's available online. Now, because we're pōhara and the Manaki Whenua Press doesn't exist anymore, you can only download it off digital, but if you talk nicely to Yvonne, she might be able to help you. Um, so that was our way of trying to get our stories out there about wetlands. Um, that's a really blurry contents page. Um, basically, just to show you that first arrow is saying there's a section here talking about the process of engagement, or Kapu T 101. And that's just an example of one of our stories from the Tore Pari wetland on the west coast of Waikato. Uh, we have stories about cultural resources that are found in wetlands, so things like our kuta. And um, Garth Harmsworth, who's a bit of a guru in this space and has been 
for a very, very long time, created all these posters about 10 years ago, and we've tried to revitalise them and make them a bit more relevant to our people. So they're focused on what we valued within wetlands and how we might have measured how our wetlands were doing okay. Um, then we have tools and approaches. So this is looking at really, really trying to get down to the nitty gritty and pull the stories out from our people. How are they doing their restoration? Why is the restoration important to them? Um, and what sort of things could we look at? So things like even, dare I say it, considering the value, or not, um, of using herbicides. Um, and I'll show you some examples of why herbicides have become kind of important in wetland restoration later. So te reo te repo was our, originally our way of trying to fill a gap. We went, OK, we can't see many of our stories from our people. We want to find a way of making that in there. But we also want to find a way of actually connecting our people across the mutu. Because we were hearing different stories that were happening everywhere, but no one actually knew that someone else in the mutu was actually doing a very similar project. So we wanted to find a way to make it more accessible online. So that's what te reo te repo is basically about. Um, but you can see the map there, it's a little bit Waikato-centric, and that's maybe because I was working there at the time. Um, so I'm putting the wedo out to everybody that um, this resource is meant to be a living document, and that's the beauty of it being online, is you can keep updating it as regularly or not regularly as you want. So we are asking the whānau, those of you who are looking at restoration for tuna, you're probably restoring wetlands to do that. And we would really love to hear your stories, and not just us hear your stories, but we'd like to be able to share your stories with everyone else across the Motu. And believe it or not, Fano, we're getting hits overseas as well. So indigenous people and universities overseas have been reading this document too. So who knows? We could take over the world. It'd be awesome. Um, but what I, what I do want to highlight is I want to highlight some situations that popped up for me. And, I might get slapped for this later, but the reason why I wanted to bring it up here is I thought this is the right forum to do it. If I say something out of turn, you'll gently smack me around later. Um, if I maybe at least bring something up that we can debate and talk about and get us thinking would be great. And um, one of the things I wanted to highlight was this conundrum of the keystone or the iconic species. It's a very, very important term. We, we need to be able to hook onto something to put energy into and to be able to uh, analyse and do things around and support that taonga, for example. Um, but sometimes we forget that not all the taonga behave exactly the same way. And they all need slightly different things in place to make it work. And sometimes we also forget that some things are connected, not us, but we, we're, sometimes it's forgotten out there that things are connected to these spaces that we had forgotten were connected to those spaces. And one of them, um, one of my favourite birds, is the ruru. And um, a lot of people think, when we talk about ruru, they think land bird. And it is. It doesn't particularly like getting its feet wet. But the ruru does like to have water for its feathers. It likes to have it. It helps it move really quietly. Eh? I've got, got nods over there. It's great. I'm doing something right. Um, so the thing is, when you talk to um, some of our komata in Waikato, they would be talking about the river and they would have the ruru in the same sentence as they were talking about trees or areas along the river. And we forget that that bird doesn't know the difference between a wetland or a freshwater system or land. It just flies around and does its thing. And if there's a handy tree over somewhere, it's going to go plant itself there. And there was a tree that was found in that area that they all used to roost in right on the river. But that tree was taken down for the Pukekoi discharge. Sorry, anyone who's from Auckland? Actually, no, I'm not. Um, but yeah, so, you know, um, the ruru was a major and an important part of riparian restoration. The thing is, though, when we're getting excited about doing riparian restoration, we all went, let's put wetlands everywhere. And ooh, look, nasty willows and nasty macrocarpa and nasty pine trees. Ooh, they're from England, boo. Um, let's knock them down now. <laughs> Chainsaw, gone. The problem is, it takes about 100 to 200 years for our native trees to get big enough for birds like the ruru to be able to nest in them. So in the meantime, you take all these trees out, lovely, flat, little kahikatea, about this high, and the ruru floating around kind of going, well, thanks, where do I have to live? And um, dare I say it, my husband's an arborist, I plant them, he kills them, um, and he unfortunately one day brought home a baby ruru because he'd been asked to bring down a macrocarpa. 
and inside the macrocarpa was a uru nest. So that highlighted to us that whilst we've got the best intentions of trying to make things native again and bringing back our taonga species, sometimes we forget that they've had to adapt, just like we had to, to colonisation. And in the meantime, all they've got, like the ruru, all they've got are macrocarpa, pine trees, willows and gums. So that was one thing that popped out. We're trying to fix stuff for the river, we're trying to fix stuff for the kereru, but we forget there's these other animals that are connected to that system as well. Uh -huh. So um, there's a guy here who's an artist, so I'm just going to quickly go past that picture. Um, the next one I wanted to highlight was, um, and I discovered this while working on, uh, with Inanga, Matamata as they're known in the, the lower river. I'm sorry, Fano, for keeping the refer to Waikato, but it's because I knew it. Um, but the matuku, or the bittern, is uh, a very rare animal, incredibly awesome. I worked at Arana Park in Christchurch. Who's from Christchurch who knows Arana Park? You know Arana Park, eh? Yeah. And I got chased around constantly by a matuku. She was wicked. I loved her. And the kereru used to dive bomb me. Um, but the, the matuku are awesome birds, they're great, but they're really endangered and their populations are getting smaller in Aotearoa. And spaces like Whanganui, uh, Wellington, Waikato in the South Island, they're the last little bastions of where these, these birds can be found. And one of the things they discovered was actually that matuku really, really like hanging out in areas where matamata like to spawn, where they like to lay their eggs. So um, one of the things to bear in mind then for the matuku is that if you're going to restore an area, you've got to make sure that the drains aren't too big. Because if they're too big, the matuku won't go in there. They don't like getting covered in water. The other thing is you've got to make sure there's a little bit of shelter for them. So that makes you think about matamata habitat, spawning habitat restoration a little bit differently. Yeah? Maybe? No? Um, there's a really cool picture there. You can't really see them. But that's a, a matuku hanging around the reeds and stuff that were put in for white bait restoration uh, in Horofenua way. There's some wetland restoration over there. Um, what we also did, though, is we went out and we said to our whānau, the kaumātua down at Tupuaha, um, hey, what do white bait like to hang out in? What do you remember the white bait hanging out in? And they gave us a full list, right from plants found in the water all the way up to the kahikatea at the back. And they told us plants that we hadn't even thought of or that science hadn't recorded. Now, that's not to say that scientists are stupid. Um, it's just that no one had ever bothered to ask them before what they had known with what they had grown up with. So... Um, that in itself sort of again paints a different kind of picture about what white bait spawning habitat could be restored like. Um, the third thing I want to highlight though is that um, getting the balance right is not always easy in restoration, particularly when we're talking about wetlands. Uh, our white bait, because they're like the rudu, they've lost a lot of native stuff. They've had to adapt. Unfortunately, they've adapted really, really well to weeds. And they happen, two of them, this guy over here called Yorkshire Fog, and this guy over here called Kaikuyu Grass, are really popular for pasture, um, and came over with the pasture kind of sector, sector. Again, I'm not trying to attack anyone in the industry, I'm just highlighting these plants have come over. The problem with them is that they're really, really bad for wetland restoration. So if you have those things growing near a wetland, Unfortunately, you're probably going to have to use herbicide to control them because otherwise if they're left to seed, if their seeds are left in the ground, they're going to keep taking over your wetland plantings. Um, but the problem is our white bait love them. They will spawn in them like it's going out of fashion. Another plant, this guy over here, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not being rude. Okay, its names are Wandering Jew, Wandering Willie, or Tradescantia. Okay? <laughs> I did not come up with the names. I just want to clarify that. Um, so the wandering, insert whatever you like, um, is uh, a really, really bad pest for our ngahiri. So it forms really, really big, thick mats. It, it smothers out seeds, so our native seeds can't come through, seedlings can't come through. Um, but when they're on the side of a river that has nothing else, our whitebait love spawning in them. And we had an incident in the Waikato where we had to kind of challenge a biocontrol, two biocontrols actually, they wanted to bring two insects into the Waikato to control that plant. And we said, don't you dare. And they're like, why? And we said, because that's all our white bait have got in certain parts of Tapuha. They've got nothing else. Until you, unfortunately, until you can find something else for us, we've got no other way of protecting our fish. 
In that particular situation, that's where we had to do our compromise and that's where we had to find our balance. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the right decision for everybody. But these are the things that came up when we were doing this restoration handbook. Because we were able to share our stories, we were able to share our insights, we were able to share our learnings, we could actually start understanding different pictures that were happening around the motu and start building better ways of thinking about how we restore things. Does that make sense? No? No? So what's the connection to tuna? <laughs> um, just saying that focusing on our tuna is really important. You know, these guys are very long-lived. They are what we call the apex or the top predator. I've seen pictures of them taking out ducks. Um, and they're awesome animals. You know, I think they're amazing. But the wetlands are not just places that should support just tuna or just whitebait or just harakeke. They need to be thought of as supporting everything. So we're saying that the issue that's happening for us that we're picking up is that the funders and the um, major supporting and planning is focusing on this idea of go after the iconic species. Um, the problem is, is that it risks us siloing our knowledge and siloing our whakapapa. Now this is just my observation, I'm not saying I'm right, and you can slap me later, okay? But the big thing is, is that recording our stories now is very, very important, whānau. Our kaumātua are passing away very, very quickly. And if we don't record something, we are going to lose that knowledge. And I have seen examples of where things have disappeared from regions over the last hundred years and the knowledge completely gone. And I've had to have a stupid argument with people to try and get them to pay attention to something I'm really passionate about because it's important, because I'm impassioned about it, um, but it's not for them anymore because they can't remember. So, my take home observations from doing the reo te repo and to talking with you guys, ooh, no, ooh, uh, ta, ta, um, is restore the whakapapa of the wetland. Don't just think about restore for the blah, restore the whakapapa, and we've talked about whakapapa a lot during this hui. So what are they connected to? And our mātauranga is obviously important, but our mātauranga is not just important for what's in our head, but what we remember smelling and tasting and touching and hearing. All those things are, make a really important components that sometimes we take for granted and we forget about. Um, most importantly, what specific taonga species do we remember being in certain places? Um, when did they used to be there? Because they don't all hang out there at exactly the same time and have a party and go, hey, midwinter Christmas, time for the tuna to gather over in uh, Horofenua. Um, and what else was there at the same time? And why were our people actually in the vicinity at the time watching it? Were they harvesting or were we doing something else? Um, I agree with the all that science is really vital and I'm so jealous that um, you go north, apparently. I, I, thought you, I thought you were like dedicated to us in the Waikato and Wanganu, apparently not. That's it, we're not speaking to you anymore. Um, Science, planning and strategies, can, that's Erica by the way, um, can help by breaking the complexity into easier to handle bits. So they're really good at going, oh my god, it's so much going on, we can take it down to here and we'll concentrate on this. But we know our whakapapa of these spaces, so don't forget to teach them how to reconnect it back. Okay, don't ever forget that. Um, and finally, who was big for the dinner? So, <laughs> Despite the fact that we have conferences and books galore and, 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 and research about the tuna, nobody wrote an article about it for Te Reo Te Repo. <gasps> Boo! Um, so, <laughs> I'm putting a whittle out to, actually I've got two whittle, I'll come back to the first one in a minute. My first whittle to, to people in the room is we need an article about the tuna. It's kind of a waste of time going, oh, it's not just about the tuna, it's not just about blah, when we don't even have an article about the tuna in Te Reo Te Repo. So I'm putting it out there. If someone would like to write an article about it, we would love to have it so we can add it to this book for our people, okay? The second word I want to put is, um, I said I know nothing about tuna and I still don't, but I do know this, and I do know that dams kill tuna, and I do know that dams are required to light buildings and to make hot coffee and toast. So my weddle is this. Where's my bosses? I better hide. Um, is I would like to see the next tuna conference be as energy efficient as possible to show people that we don't necessarily have to rely on the very things that are killing our tonga. And that's what I'm going to say on that. Um, so, if you're keen to submit a story about the tuna, um, there's Yvonne Toto, who's right over there with the white scarf, or Bev Clarkson. And um, no partai, but I just wanted to show you this meme. It's hilarious. If you can't read it, eels always look like they've just told a joke and are waiting for a reaction. <laughs> and 
and that, my cousin, is how you get a laugh.